The Red Sea Crossing. You may order a copy of this program through arcdiscovery.com. See arcdiscovery.com to become a direct seller of this DVD. Join us now as we begin Revealing God's Treasure. The Red Sea Crossing. Egypt is steeped with a grand history of ancient science, technology, and beautiful structures. But is there evidence of the children of Israel ever living there? Many years ago, this large stone was discovered in the first cataract of the Nile on Elephantine Island. The inscription states, for seven years, there had been no satisfactory inundation of the Nile. As the result of this, grain of every kind was very scarce. In this terrible trouble, King Chesser remembered the god Imhotep, who had once delivered Egypt from a similar calamity. Imhotep can be found in Egyptian history in many places, and it appears he was a sage who was elevated to a god over a period of centuries after his death. Perhaps most confident was Imhotep, the architect who probably conceived of building Zoser's tomb completely from stone. Known as a sculptor, a priest, a healer, Imhotep is considered the preeminent genius of the Old Kingdom. Imhotep had even saved his country from famine. Could Imhotep and Joseph have been one and the same person? We head to Saqqara, Egypt, a short distance south of Cairo. This is where the first pyramid was built in ancient Egypt. It is called the Step Pyramid due to the distinct levels in its shape. We can see where a smooth veneer layer of limestone had once been applied over the brick, creating a smooth surface, but most of it has since been removed. Here is where we find the statue of Pharaoh Zoser, under whom Imhotep served. It was on the base of this statue of Zoser that Imhotep was mentioned as a man not as a god. He was first after the king, with his cartouche shown here. At the complex of buildings, the main hall is of importance to us. It was here and in other locations in Egypt that Joseph saved his country from famine. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them, seven years of famine will deplete the land. In Joseph's day, as one entered the building, they would make their way down this hallway to purchase grain. 
there would be many cashiers available for customers of various languages to trade for the much needed food. The famine was all over the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. As we exit the hallway through the area in the rear, we see over on one side a series of deep structures where grain was stored underground during the seven years of plenty. Then over the next seven years, it was sold to the Egyptians and visitors from other countries. A system of vertical underground silos created a cooler environment for the grain to be stored. This was the design of the genius, Joseph. When grain was removed from storage, the oldest grain was carried up by way of this long descending stairway. The grain silos were interconnected via tunnels, which allowed the grain to flow down to a central exit point located at the bottom of this stairway. A record of this event of removing the grain can be seen on hieroglyphics such as this at Thebes, showing the sacks of grain being carried up the stairs from the granaries. Another example of this can be seen at the tomb of Itti. As a way to honor the Lord of Heaven, Joseph built this first pyramid in Egypt at Saqqara to show his thankfulness to the Lord for honoring him and saving the Egyptian people from famine. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Centuries later, many other great pyramids were built in Egypt following the lead of Joseph or Imhotep. 2.3 million large blocks of stone, weighing two to three tons each, were used in the largest pyramid, causing some to wonder how they could have been constructed using ancient technology. It has been a mystery for centuries. Ron Wyatt conducted a great deal of research on the subject to help shed light on this puzzle. He read the account of Herodotus, who wrote, the stones intended for use in constructing the pyramids were lifted by means of a short wooden scaffold. Lifting devices were provided for each step. Mr. Wyatt noticed lift devices in hieroglyphics. These lift devices would have been placed on each side of stones that were to be raised. At Saqqara, we can see hieroglyphics of three lift machines next to a pyramid shape, linking the two together. Large wooden levers were found in King Tut's tomb that were used in the machines. A series of these levers were placed alongside the blocks to be raised and would operate in unison. A large stone was loaded onto the machine, then the levers on each side were pulled downward by ropes tied to turning winches, thus raising the stone block as needed. When the block was raised to the proper height, it was rolled onto the next level and then raised again. A series of lift machines would have been utilized. Mr. Wyatt demonstrated this type of lift machine to Mr. Nasif Hassan, head of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization of Cairo. The demonstration was filmed by Japanese Nippon Television and later aired in Japan. This lift machine appears to be a simple solution to the mystery of constructing the pyramids. When Moses was a baby, his adoptive Egyptian mother was Hatshepsut, and Moses' name was Sinmut. The serpent on his forehead signifies his title of prince. As an adult, Moses' Egyptian name was Tutmosis II. A side profile of Moses demonstrates his distinctive Hebrew-shaped nose. After Moses killed the Egyptian, he fled from Egypt and its territories for fear of the current Pharaoh. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Median. Moses was married and then had a son, whose name described their foreign home. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. This tells us Moses was not in any area controlled by the Egyptians. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. The Lord told Moses to bring the children of Israel back to this mountain outside of Egypt. After 10 plagues had struck Pharaoh and the Egyptians, he finally agreed to let Moses take the children of Israel from Egypt. Based upon the research he conducted, Ron Wyatt believed that the Pharaoh of the Exodus 
was Amenhotep III. Here we see Amenhotep receiving the Ankh as a type of power and new life being infused into his body. Mr. Wyatt speculated that Amenhotep's eldest son was Tutankhamun and that he was killed by the destroying angel in the 10th plague. Tut would have been the crown prince and co-ruler with his father at that time in the late 18th dynasty in 1446 BC. Surprisingly, in the Biblical Archaeology Review, it stated that the majority of archaeologists do not believe in the exodus from Egypt. Tradition has told us that the exodus from Egypt led the children of Israel to the Sinai Peninsula, but no evidence has been found of their having been in that location for 40 years. Also, tradition has said that the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea in an area that does not match the biblical account. Could the Bitter Lakes be the Red Sea spoken of in the Bible? Could thousands of soldiers all drown in relatively shallow water? The traditional Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa, is located in the southern mountainous area of the Sinai Peninsula. This mountain was chosen by Helena, the mother of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century. It was not chosen by any archaeological evidence at the site, but was based upon the dreams of Constantine and subsequently chosen by Helena as Mount Sinai. Later, in the 6th century, the Emperor Justinian built St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of the mountain to establish a sense of authenticity to the site. This is tradition, but what is the truth? Let's break out of a man-made story and ask the question, should tradition supersede the Bible? What does the Bible tell us about the exodus from Egypt? The children of Israel were living in the best of the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. This area is the fertile Nile Delta in northern Egypt. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. This also describes the fertile Nile Delta. The Nile Delta is shown here at the northern termination of the Nile, full of lush vegetation in contrast to the surrounding desert. On the night of Passover, the firstborn in each Egyptian home died in the final plague. Then, the children of Israel left Egypt that same day. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. On that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. On the day of Passover, the children of Israel crossed the canals of the Nile and became an organized unit at Succoth. They had left the country of Egypt proper, but they were still in territory controlled by the Egyptians. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. The wilderness of the Red Sea is what we call today the Sinai Peninsula, which is surrounded on two sides by the Red Sea. It was through the northern region of the peninsula that they traveled day and night making their rapid escape from the hands of Pharaoh. During the day, they were shaded by the pillar of cloud that would have also provided moisture for them. At night, the pillar of fire would have given them light for their journey. At Etham, they turned south and headed through the mountains in the wilderness of the Red Sea, traveling through a narrow canyon, then stopping at the Red Sea. This expanse of water is called the Gulf of Aqaba today, but in Moses' day, it was called the Red Sea. King Solomon also built a fleet of ships at Zion Geber, which is near Elath, on the shore of the Red Sea, in the land of Edom. Ancient Elath is modern-day Elat, Israel. Our modern Gulf of Aqaba is the ancient Red Sea, or Yam Suf. This is the beach where the children of Israel were trapped with nowhere to escape. The Egyptian army was fast approaching, and it appeared death was imminent. The children of Israel cried out, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? The children of Israel were already out of Egypt when they were preparing to cross the Red Sea. This would exclude any crossing of the Bitter Lakes or the Gulf of Suez. It was at this site that God was preparing to demonstrate to prove His loving care for them. 
This is the large beach on the Gulf of Aqaba, called Nueva Egypt. This is where it appeared that the forces of darkness were about to be triumphant, but God was in control. Across the Gulf is the land of Median and the holy mountain of God. They were to camp between Migdol and the sea, Migdol meaning a fortified city or tower. At the north end of the beach are the remains of an ancient fort, still partially standing today. It was once a three-story structure, capable of housing hundreds of Egyptian soldiers who could have prevented any northern escape from the beach. The location is precisely at the narrowest point of land, between the mountains and the sea, in order to control the movement of travelers through the area. The fortress today is receiving a fresh coat of stucco, which is unfortunately covering up the original stone blocks. At the front of the fortress, we were able to see the stonework that formed the entrance into the structure. In the middle of the courtyard, we can see an ancient well that would have supplied the fresh water for the many Egyptian soldiers that were housed here. Outside, we can see how tall the structure had been in its former days, a full three stories in height. Another description of the location for the Red Sea crossing was Camp before Pihai Araf, which means mouth of a hole or canyon. As the children of Israel entered the beach, they had made their way through a system of canyons or wadis and encountered this beach at the Red Sea. The Bible tells us, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. They had finally made it through the canyons that snaked their way through the mountains, but now they were trapped on the beach. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was here that the pillar of cloud blocked the Egyptians from advancing toward the children of Israel. For there was on each side a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea, which were impassable by reason of their roughness and obstructed their flight. There must have been excitement as they reached the beach at the sea, but that soon turned to gloom as they discovered their plight. They were trapped on the beach, awaiting their death at the hands of Pharaoh. From the middle of the beach, we can see the opening of Pihairoth in the distance but we head south in order to locate an amazing marker here at the beach. Near the road, we see this large pillar. 78, during his first visit to this beach. It had fallen down and was lying in the edge of the water, but today it is about 500 feet from the sea and has been set in concrete. features of the red granite pillar include the fact that it is of Phoenician or Hebrew design and is 3,000 years old. It was placed here for a reason, to mark the location of the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground. This pillar is even mentioned in the Bible, a pillar to the Lord at its, Egypt's border. At the south end of the beach is where we can see the pillar. A matching column on the other side of the Gulf in Saudi Arabia was found by Ron Wyatt in 1984 and was shown to Saudi authorities. On the Saudi pillar were Hebrew inscriptions which included the words Pharaoh, Mizram or Egypt, Moses, Death, Water, Yahweh, Solomon and Edom. The inscriptions on this column have been removed since the Egyptians living here were not excited about a Hebrew celebration marker located in their own backyard. Using Google Earth, one can zoom in on the beach here and spot the pillar standing near the road. This is an exciting use of technology to see the Bible come alive.
A short distance downhill, we come to the edge of the water where a wonderful miracle took place, where the Lord provided protection to his people, even though they were angry and complaining. Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? For centuries, this beach has been named for the crossing of the Red Sea at this exact spot. On Google Earth, we can see the name Nueva at this point on the beach. This older, detailed map reveals to us the complete name of the beach. Nueva is short for Nueva Almuzayina. The name on this beach, Nueva Almuzayina, gives us confirmation that we are in the correct location. The translation of that name means Waters of Moses Open. This is where the waters opened by the hand of God. The Lord demonstrated to his people that he would be their protector. We have confirmation that we are at the correct location. Moses once stood here with the children of Israel and the water was opened before them by the hand of God. An amazing testimony of truth. Depth charts of the Gulf of Aqaba show the Elat Deep to the north and the Aragonese Deep to the south. Between these two deep areas is a path through the sea. When Ron Wyatt was at this spot in 1978, he decided to inspect the water. is very clear with high visibility. Investigations have revealed artifacts which confirm our previous conclusions about the site. The sea floor is smooth and contains gradual contours. Our first artifact to inspect is this chariot wheel that still has three of its four spokes, plus the hub is extending upward. We see 90 degree angles here, which are a sign of man-made structure. The Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians and he took off their chariot wheels. The chariot wheel with six spokes was the most widely used by the Egyptians. Egyptian chariots were known to use metal hubs in the center of the wheels. Using metal detectors, Divers have found metal in the raised hubs that are now covered in coral. Here we see another four-spoked chariot wheel with one spoke missing and a center raised hub. The coral here has preserved the chariot parts by retaining the man-made structure, even after the wood has disappeared. Here we see another wheel suspended on its axle, standing at attention. It has six spokes and a raised center hub. Ron Wyatt made many dives here and located many artifacts. This could have once been a chariot cab. This appears to be another round chariot wheel. Horse remains have also been found here, such as this shrunken hoof. Horses are not in the Sinai Peninsula today. Human remains have also been found, such as this coral-covered femur bone on the right. Lab tests confirmed that it is in fact bone. Other bones have also been found. A cross-section reveals the bone inside the coral. Here we see a chariot wheel standing on its axle in this old 1978 footage shot by Ron Wyatt. Next, we see an eight-spoke wheel with one spoke missing. Eight-spoke wheels were only used during the 18th dynasty, the time of the Exodus. The premier find here at the crossing site is this gold veneer that was left behind from a four-spoke chariot wheel. The Bible tells us there were 600 choice chariots used in the chase of the children of Israel. This artifact was left behind at a depth of 200 feet. Since specialized equipment would be necessary to raise it to the surface, 
Today, it is still in the location where it was found. Since there are chariot parts on this side of the Red Sea crossing, could there be other chariot parts on the other side of the Gulf, showing a continuation of artifacts? On the shore opposite of Nueva, inspection of the seafloor in Saudi Arabia has also been conducted to see if chariot parts can be found on this side of the Red Sea crossing. While investigating the Saudi Arabian waters, Vivica Pontian found this beautiful round chariot wheel specimen with a raised center hub. This is confirmation of the chariot parts continuing to the other side of the crossing site, opposite Nueva. By confirming the location of the Red Sea crossing, one is then able to conclude without a doubt that the real Mount Sinai must be over in Saudi Arabia, in Median, just as the Bible says. The Red Sea Crossing You may order a copy of this program through arcdiscovery.com. See arcdiscovery.com to become a direct seller of this DVD.